in this week's news. Angry scenes after Pakistan church bombings. Mass baptisms in Central America. And Christian artists celebrate faithful creativity. This is In Focus Christian News and Current Affairs. Hello, thanks so much for joining us this week. I'm Kent Kingston, and my colleague at the news desk is Sabelle Coutte. How are you, Sabelle? Very well, thank you, Kent. And you? Yeah, I'm fine. Now, Kent, I understand that you think we'll be in for a few surprises this week. Well, yeah, look, I know I was surprised when the other day I came across an expression of support from the Australian Christian lobby to legalise medical marijuana. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be asking Lyle Shelton about that. Uh, but sprouted bread with Sue Red, you'd know a bit about that. Not a I, surprise there. I love sprouted bread. Haven't had it for a while, but it's very tasty. Okay, yeah, well, I'm looking forward to getting my head around that. And it's also going to be great to chat with Nathan Brown about his new book with the slightly dubious title, Why I Try to Believe. I uh, hear it's been a bit controversial. Okay. Well, if we're all ready, I think I'll try to read the news. Yeah, we're good to go. A devastating church bombing attack by an ISIS-affiliated group in Pakistan earlier this month has left at least 17 people dead and 70 wounded. According to the Religious Liberty Prayer Bulletin, the shooting and bombing attacks on the two churches, one Protestant and one Catholic, happened during packed Sunday worship services in Lahore. Witnesses say the death toll would have been much higher if volunteer security guards hadn't physically tackled the suicide bombers, preventing them from getting into the church buildings before the bombs were detonated. Violent protests erupted in the wake of the attacks, with an angry mob from the Christian community killing two men they believe to be connected with the attacks. Media attention in the wake of tropical cyclone Pam has been on Vanuatu, but a number of other South Pacific nations were also affected by the Category 5 storm. According to UN News, the government of Tuvalu has declared a state of emergency after 42% of its population was affected by flooding from cyclone-related tidal surges. Tuvalu is dominated by the Congregational EKT Church, which has links with the Uniting Church in Australia. We have appealed to the Christian communities in the international arena to respond as Christian brothers and sisters. Also last week we dedicated that Sunday for uh, Cyclone Pan in remembering those who have been affected not only here in Tuvalu but also extended to our Pacific brothers and sisters. In what's thought to be an historic first, a Catholic Archbishop has been charged with concealing child sexual abuse. According to the ABC, the allegations go back to the 1970s, when the now Archbishop of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, was serving as a priest in New South Wales' Maitland Diocese. The claim is that he failed to pass along claims to police that a fellow priest had abused a child. Archbishop Wilson has denied the allegation and says he will fight the charges. Five Australians are struggling with poverty, have shared morning tea and a chat with politicians at Parliament House in Canberra. The meeting was organised by Uniting Church Minister, the Reverend Bill Cruz, who heads up the Exodus Foundation in Sydney. Each of the five guests of the morning tea brought his or her unique situation to the table. Homelessness mental illness, addiction. The hosts were veteran government MP Philip Ruddock and opposition senator Sam Dastiari. The Reverend Cruz says politicians need to look beyond the middle class voting bloc to the worsening problems faced by Australia's poor. Massive evangelistic efforts in Central America have seen more than 6,000 people baptised into Jesus and accepted into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in recent weeks. According to Adventist Review, 2,500 were baptised in Panama, 2,000 in Nicaragua, and 1,500 in El Salvador in connection with separate evangelistic meeting series. In Guatemala, a 110-year-old man was born again through baptism. Some claim he's the oldest person ever to be baptised by an Adventist pastor. The Inter-American Division, with its 3.7 million members, is the largest of the Adventist Church's 13 world regions. 
Adventist young people also went large scale last weekend in celebrating Global Youth Day. In our towns, in our countries, in our world. In 24 hours, 8 million youth made an impact in others' lives, bringing the gospel to our communities through acts of kindness. This year, we can do more. Under the theme, Be the Sermon, youth groups around the world skipped church and put a new spin on the expression, church service, reaching out to their communities in various ways. A continuous webcast of the post-service celebrations came from 19 locations around the world during a 24-hour period. The commission has been given, it's time to go. We have been called for such a time as this. We are an end-time generation with end-time DNA, riding on three angels' wings. Call us end-time SDA. A new movie project on one of the biggest religious freedom stories of 2014 has run into trouble and been cancelled, even before the cameras were able to start rolling. Mariam Ibrahim was sentenced to death in Sudan last year for the crime of converting from Islam to Christianity. After an international outcry, she was released and allowed to leave the country. Last week, filmmakers wanting to dramatize her story complained of discrimination after Facebook rejected the fundraising ad for the movie I Am a Christian. But according to Christian Post, complaints from Mariam Ibrahim herself eventually scuttled the project. She said the filmmakers were exploiting her and had received no permission to use her story. And in another fundraising fail, a social media backlash has prompted Creflo Dollar Ministries in the USA to scale down requests for donations to purchase a $65 million private jet. The International Evangelist's current plane is 30 years old and, after a near miss during takeoff, is now considered unsafe. For over 20 years, you've been a part of getting Creflo Dollar Ministries to distant lands to share the truth of the gospel. We have offices on multiple continents, and our ministry stretches across television, personal appearances, and meeting the needs of people all over the world. So a plane is a vital part of the mission of our ministry. This fundraising video is no longer on the Creflo Dollar Ministries website, along with any specific mention of the project. Composers, writers, filmmakers and other creative types gathered at Avondale College north of Sydney last weekend to consider the challenge of faithful creativity. Local and international speakers with real-world experience in using the arts to communicate the message of Jesus were featured at this year's Manifest Creative Arts Festival. An award ceremony recognized both established and up-and-coming artists. The premier prize, the Gabe Reno Award, went to New Zealand's Jeremy Dixon, whose creativity in the culinary arts, photography and book design was recognized. Jeremy brings the message of holistic living to New Zealanders through his Revive Cafes and Healthy Recipe books. And maybe Jeremy needs to take a trip to the Pacific Islands, where it seems pastors are leading the way to obesity, diabetes and an early death. At a recent meeting of more than 120 Adventist pastors in Fiji, health checks revealed that only seven were at their ideal weight and almost half were at risk of diabetes. The problem? Too much sitting in church meetings and being the honoured guest at potluck dinners and other special events. The pastors from Fiji, Samoa, Solomon Islands and elsewhere have agreed to take on a four-month weight loss challenge by changing their lifestyle, eating healthier, eating less and exercising more. And that's this week's news. Over to you, Kent. Thanks, Sibel. Stay with us. I'll be back with Lyle Shelton and Politics in Focus straight after the break. So you think you've got your future all planned out, right? Or maybe you're not sure yet what you want to do, who you want to be, but whatever path you choose to study, a great education matters. Because it doesn't just help you get a great job, it helps you prepare for what life can throw at you and live a great life. Avondale, 
It's education designed for life. Hello, welcome back. And now, as promised, we go to Canberra where I hear Lyle Shelton has embraced marijuana and maybe even changing the name of the organisation to the Australian Rastafarian Lobby. Did I get that right, Lyle? I'm not sure about that, Kent, um, although it sounds very hipterish. Uh, but no, we, we haven't become Rastafarian. But uh, in all seriousness, Kent, the uh, Senate's Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee is holding a public inquiry into medical uh, use of marijuana. Now, uh, we think uh, this is something that should be investigated and uh, would be very open to if after the normal rigorous testing and trials, uh, it can be found that uh, cannabis can be harnessed for pain relief, uh, for medicinal purposes, then it should be allowed to be onto them on the market. You're not talking about smoking it though, are you? No, we're not at all. And uh, the experts say that that would not be a good medical outcome um, and, and certainly not a, a regime where there would be self prescription, you know, with people perhaps growing their own plants and, and smoking it uh, under a, a self-prescription regime. This is only after uh, trials are done and, and only uh, at the prescription of a doctor. Uh, in the same way, Kent, that, uh, that the ingredients of heroin are used uh, in morphine uh, to great effect, um, it, it seems like there's great scope for cannabis to be used in the same way under uh, proper trials and proper medical prescription. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned morphine, uh, Lyle, but of course we have a huge issue in Australia with uh, people being addicted to prescription drugs, you know, including opioids, you know, like morphine. Would do you think introducing cannabis into our, you know, pharmaceutical environment would make that better or worse? Uh, it's it's a risk with any new drug, uh, Ken, and as you point out, um, th there's already an issue there with with. Uh, addiction to prescription drugs. Uh, I, I would see it as no different to any other situation. Uh, it's just important that we have it uh, properly trialled and properly prescribed uh, to avoid that possibility as much as possible. OK, now just quickly on to another topic, Lyle. The Pakistan cricket team has just left Australia. They've been knocked out of the, the One Day World Cup. But you suggested that maybe Pakistan shouldn't have even been in Australia in the first place. Well, well, Kent, during the 70s and 80s, uh, South Africa was very much on the outer in terms of uh, participating in international sporting events because of the evil apartheid regime. In Pakistan at the moment, we have people on death row uh, for the simple uh, supposed crime of blaspheming the prophet Muhammad. Uh, there's many, many people, many Christians, including uh, Asia Bibi, a mother of five, who uh, just late last year had her sentence to death by hanging confirmed by a court in Lahore. Now this is uh, outrageous and uh, we shouldn't have the Pakistani cricket team in our country without at least raising uh, diplomatic objection uh, to these terrible blasphemy laws. Yeah, food for thought there. Hey, thanks so much for your time this week, Lyle. Really appreciate it. Pleasure, Ken. Thanks for having us. And now it's over to James Toogood and Food in Focus. You won't believe it, but God in the Holy Bible gave the prophet Ezekiel a recipe using ancient super grains to make an ancient superfood. The Essenes, 100 years before Christ, the Essene supreme bread. It's still made today if you know where to buy it. It's made of sprouted grain. Sue, tell us about it. <laughs> I'm going to try some. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, mm. Basically, sprouted mm. grain breads are made, as you suggest, mm. from sprouted grains. So it can be any grains like spelt or kamut, mm. for example, but often they even add things like lentils inside or millet. Um, so it's a very wholesome cake. Mm. So it's basically the sprouts uh, crafted together in a loaf mm. and looks a bit like a cake. Mm but it contains no flour, usually no additives like sugar or vinegar or, oh. or milk oh, it's or, or preservatives. <laughs> so it's really good for those people who are looking mm. for more whole grains mm. that are free of these additives. You know, it's actually very tasty. This one's got dates and walnuts and all mm. sorts of scrumptious things. That one's things. perfect for mm. like, you know, a, a snack food. So if you're looking to replace those biscuits mm. that come out of packets, why not just have mm. some sprouted grain bread with dates and um, with walnuts. It's really delicious. Now, sprouts are very nutritious. Tell us why. They are, because when you sprout any seed, um, you bring it back to life, you reduce the amount of phytates and mm. various inhibitors like trypsin inhibitor, mm -hmm. and that helps release the nutrients better. Ah, okay. So it releases the minerals. So you actually get 
better availability of those nutrients in, mm. in, inside so your So it's food. a nutrient dense bread. It Incredibly. really truly is a superfood. So everyone's mm. interested at the moment in ancient grains mm. um, and whole grains mm -hmm. and this is probably the prime example of a superfood amongst mm. the breads category mm -hmm. because it is made from whole grains that have been sprouted. Mm. Yeah. Now it's not overcooked so the nutrients go, don't get demolished well, indeed, along the way. Well it's not cooked. Yeah. Traditionally the mm. Essenes made it without any formal way of cooking. I believe mm. they used to sort of cook it by putting mm. it on, on, on rocks yes. just in the sun. They were allowed to warm it in the Israeli <laughs> sun 2,000 years ago. That's the only cooking. Yes. Yeah. So you know it's even suitable for people who are on raw mm. food diets, mm. the, the, the correct one. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And um, just tell us a little bit about how, how do you use it? And how mm. does it work? So you could use it just like you use ordinary bread, but just mm. a few practical tips. Mm. Um, you need a moist, wet knife when you slice it because it's quite sticky mm. and you can't slice it super thin because it can mm. crumble. Mm. Um, but you don't need a lot to be mm. full. Um, the other thing I love about it is it has a long shelf life. So once oh. you buy it, you can keep it in your fridge for three months if unopened. Mm. And even once you open it, it lasts for several weeks, I found. Um, and you can even freeze it. That's, so it's got yeah. a much better shelf life than ordinary bread. Now, I remember Sue was telling me it's not just the nutrients in this, it actually does wonders for your stomach. Tell us about that. Well, one area that we're particularly interested in at the moment yeah. is the whole gut microflora, yes. the microbiome. Okay. So the bugs that live there and the mm. products that they produce. And we know that eating more whole grains mm. is very beneficial in mm -hmm. terms of promoting and maintaining mm. the colonies of those mm. beneficial bacteria. So if you eat this kind of food, mm. um, you're going to mm. promote well-being because that's yeah part of your immune system. Now where would you go and buy this? I mean, Prophet Ezekiel <laughs> bread. <laughs> well that's right, it's yeah. not found everywhere. Mm -hmm. These particular range of sprouted mm. grain breads are found mm. in health food shops okay. and you can also buy it online so mm. you can see a website online. Mm. There are some other sprout, so-called sprouted oh. grain breads in the supermarkets but you need to be a bit wary of some of them because they're not true sprouted grain breads. Okay. They sometimes have added gluten added flowers mm. but they're trying to sort of pass under the radar mm. as sprouted grain breads. So yeah. you know the, the true sprouted grain bread is one as we said just made of mm. sprouted grains that are mm. put together into a cake with no yeah. additives and it can be particularly low in things like sodium. Yes. So if you have a look huh. at say the oh well take yeah, the black take cake. One. Oh, well, you were um, going to show off the Prophet Ezekiel <laughs> bread, weren't you? I don't Ezekiel mind. 4 They're verse all 9. really yeah. low. How many milligrams of sodium yeah, let does me read that, that have? For you. It says five milligrams every hundred grams. And how does the ordinary mm. white bread from the supermarket compare? Yes, well, let me get it the right way up. So five milligrams versus. 400. 400. That's 80 times more salt in white bread. So you can per see why grams. this is so yeah. much better for your blood yeah. pressure, okay? And if yeah. you are looking for a bread that's good for your blood mm -hmm. pressure, if it's elevated, you should be mm. looking for something that contains mm. 120 milligrams or less. But these are super low. Yeah, yeah. and they taste really nice. So so I'm going to try this one, Sue. Yeah, good for your blood yeah. pressure. Good for your gut health, yeah. um, good for all kinds of chronic yeah. diseases and just mm. another alternative if you're looking for something really wholesome yeah. um, to add more whole grains. Yeah. Folks, you really need to go and search for the ancient superfoods and just enjoy it. I think the recipe came from the whole Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Very nice. Want to know the answers to your deepest questions? Log on to discoverycourses.com. 15 totally free courses discuss spirituality, lifestyle, archaeology and health. Make your personal discovery today at discoverycourses.com. Hi, welcome back. Well, this would have to be an age of doubt and secularism where people of faith, even themselves, are wondering, what do I believe? And here to help us negotiate this is Nathan Brown. How are you, Nathan? Doing well. I'm not sure I'm an expert and I'm not going to negotiate. Much. Well, we can have a chat. The title of your new, new book certainly doesn't sound very expert. Why I try to believe that's um, awfully tentative. Um, I mean, you're... Uh, <laughs> not you're, sure it's awfully tentative. I would say healthily tentative. Healthily tentative. <laughs> well, why did you pick that title? Why I try to believe? Uh, to some extent, it's a confession that you know, most of us, on our, even on our best days, there are, there are questions, mm -hmm. there are things that we can admit that we don't have all nailed down. Uh, there, you know, it's an incomplete science. Mm. You know, the, our faith is, you know, it's not something you prove, it's not something, yeah. Jesus seemed to accept the idea that the statement of, yes, I believe, helped my unbelief, yeah. 
was good enough. Yeah, one of my favourite. And he affirmed that. And um, I think there's a little bit of that in that title. So, Nathan, in this book, Why I Try to Believe, you deal with some fairly, you know, classic objections or, or doubts that people have when it comes to faith. I mean, the, the problem of pain and suffering, you mm. know, for example. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I would characterise this book as uh, a gentle apologetic. Would, would that be a, a fair description? I think the term that I invented in the introduction to the book is a personal apologetic. Okay. And so, yeah, soft apologetic, gentle apologetic probably works. Mm. Uh, but I've kind of taken a personal approach to it. It's, and if somebody simply says, so what's your book about? I would say, well, it's the things that help me make sense of my faith and to make sense of life and mm -hmm. to make those decisions that we do make in life about what's important and good and meaningful and true. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it's not necessarily wrestling with the big philosophical dark night of the soul type things, mm. but they're there in the lived experience of what life is and, and trying to maintain and sustain a life of faith in the midst okay. of those experiences. So if, if, if I had a friend who says, I, I don't believe in God, mm. you know, I can't believe that there'd be a God who would allow all this suffering, you know, to happen, which we hear, you know, fairly often. Mm. Is this the book that I then hand to my friend and say, this will sort you out, this will prove that you're wrong and that God does exist. Um, is that the purpose of this book? Is No, <laughs> I don't think it's that book. I think it's probably more the book that would raise some questions and perhaps say, here's a different way of looking at some of those questions mm -hmm. that you, that we all as human beings confront. You know, life just throws these questions at us mm. in the experiences that we come at. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm trying to prove anything in a solid, logical, argumentative sense. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to do is raise questions and to say, well, here are some of the answers that help me wrestle with those questions. Okay. So it's in some ways it's sort of very postmodern. You're sort of saying, well, this is the truth that I've discovered that works for me. Mm -hmm. Let me share that with you. And see what you can do with it. Yeah. It may yeah. work for you. It, it may not. Mm. And ultimately, without wanting to give away the punchline of the book too mm. much, ultimately I see faith as significantly a matter of choice, mm. more than a matter of proof. proof. Okay. And uh, that's where we get to in the last chapter of the book, is looking at the choice that we're presented with. Uh, I think we, along the way we've looked at some reasons why that choice may be a legitimate choice to make. Mm. Uh, but there's something in faith that actually in the definition of faith itself is that we it's the things we haven't got sorted out mm. because that's the role of faith is to say okay I don't have all the answers I don't understand it all you know to borrow the biblical phrase we see through a glass darkly mm. uh, so we haven't got the end the beginning to the end of the story all mapped out mm. but this is how I'm going to choose to live because of these things that suggest what is good and true and right and beautiful and meaningful. Okay, so um, is, is, is this book readable for an, an atheist, say? Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, and um, part of the, I guess the spark for the book was a friend of mine who experimented or has experimented with atheism. Mm. Well, it's not just this is someone who's very, this is Ryan Bell, isn't it, yeah. from, from the US who, who said, I'm going to spend the next year spending a year without God, living practically a, as an atheist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he's someone who was a friend of mine, mm. and is a friend of mine, and has been a part of the conversation of writing the book. He's wrote a, written a foreword for the book, mm -hmm. uh, which I hope is an interesting model of we can talk about these things even without. And, and basically, we make a different choice at the end of the conversation. Mm. Wow. And uh, yeah, I think that's... I think that's an important thing to do. Uh, it's not always an easy or comfortable thing to do. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, I'm hoping that part of the, the story of the book is that, is that conversation. Mm. Okay. Have you had any feedback from, uh, I guess, discounting Ryan Bell, obviously, because he has that sort of believer's background and is used to reading this sort of thing. Mm. Have you had feedback from readers who don't have a particularly religious background? Uh, it's kind of, I, I'm not sure there are, I, yes, definitely there are people who don't have a religious background, but most people in most society, Western societies have some 
religious mm. starting point. Oh, okay. Um, but in the context of, I actually wrote part of the impulse for getting the book written mm. was a um, university assignment. Mm. Uh, it was the final project for a master's degree in writing. And um, I had a quite secular, um, someone that wasn't used to reading that who was my supervisor for the project. Okay. And um, we had some good conversations in that context as well and she was very supportive and encouraging. She said, you know, I found this book humble and refreshing. Wow. And when she used those two words, I said, that was kind of what I was trying to do. Humble and refreshing. There yeah. you go. So, and obviously for someone who is a person of faith and has questions and doubts, mm. this would also work for them as well. Yeah. Yeah, it draws on my own experience of growing up in, you know, in a church setting as a pastor's as kid. Pastor's kid, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, it it's not the dramatic conversion story, but I think coming through some of the experiences that are in the book, it is the gradual conversion story of making mm -hmm. an inherited faith your own. Okay. And that's just an important part of the part, yes. uh, part of process. So Nathan, if, if I wanted to check this book out for myself or I have a friend, you know, that I think this would make a great gift, what's the best way to get hold of uh, why I tried to believe? Well, you could ask for it at a Christian bookstore near you mm -hmm. and they'd be able to track it down for you mm -hmm. if they don't have big piles of them on the shelf. Uh, also available from hopeshop.com. Okay. And um, just search the title or the author and it'll work. Okay, well there you go. And look, we also are offering 12 of these for free to our viewers. You're gonna to have to be quick though. Um, if you send us an email, uh, letters at infocus.org.au, and also you'll need to send us your address with that so we can get it to you. Um, yeah, we'll send a copy out. Um, compliments of uh, <laughs> Nathan and Record in Focus. Fun to be able to give a few things away. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Thanks for, so much for your time today, Nathan. Really appreciate it. Not a problem, thank you. We'll see you after the break. Thousands of years ago, a series of ancient prophecies were disguised within a system of mysterious symbols. For centuries, these remarkable predictions have been sealed to the world until now. Check out our new Secrets of Prophecy online course today in 24 beautifully illustrated free studies at www.itiswrittenoceania.tv or call 1300 300 389 for your free copy today. Hello, thanks so much for your time and company today. Yes, and if you'd like to add your voice to the discussion, there are plenty of ways to do it. Send us an email or drop us a note on Facebook or Twitter. The details are right there on your screen. Now, Ken, I understand we'll have some poetry on next week's In Focus. Spoken word, Sabelle. <laughs> it's spoken word. Yeah, yes, Micah Bornet will be in for our Easter episode, and I'm hoping to get him in front of the mic in focus with extra street cred. As if we need any. Well, indeed. Yeah. Hey, stay <laughs> safe and God bless. We'll see you next time. See ya. Thank you.